Good to be together as we uh, celebrate and we are deep into the fall. How many of you had to scrape a window this morning? Anybody have to scrape a window? All right. You knew it was coming. In July, you're like, it will never come. It will never come, and it is here. And so we're there already, and we say, all right, the Lord is faithful in every season. We're going to just celebrate him in this place today. Amen? Amen. 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 We celebrate Jesus in this place because he is good. And so let's do this together. Uh, If you have a Bible this morning, we'd love for you to be in it with us. We love God's word because God is speaking. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll give you one to you. If you're downstairs, uh, grab one downstairs. If you're at the garage, grab one. Uh, those are our three locations. If you're at home, have your Bible in hand. Uh, and uh, we want you to have that. Uh, I will tell you where we're going to end the service. And you might know this already that uh, we have the communion table set up as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do that at least once a month here at Harvest, at least once a month, uh, maybe more more than that, depending, we want it to flow right out of the passage, and so it all makes sense what we're doing, why we're doing it, and so you can be ready for that right now. And then uh, I can tell you, uh, Josiah already mentioned it, but uh, you might want to just follow along by using your app. It's there for you, and uh, I've entitled the message this week, it's beginning to look a lot like, all right, here we go. Ah. Uh, We're in the holiday push. I don't know if you know that. We're in the holiday push. It seems like we stack them up at the end of the end of the season, end of the year, every year, and we have several several holidays coming. Uh, Maybe you didn't know this, but the holiday season kicked off on Friday with the beginning of the World Series. That's right. That's right. And uh, that that's a holiday uh, where, where many people are celebrating, even if it's not your team. And so we celebrate that. And then Tuesday is Halloween. And then we have Veterans Day. And then maybe, maybe, maybe the last ever Apple Cup is coming this year. That's a holiday. What do we do with it after that? We don't know. Thanksgiving is coming. And then Christmas and boom, we're at the end of the year. It's New Year's. You don't even get to have, uh, be able to take a breath. And so we have this, I, I, I think about it as the mashup at the end of the year. We have all these holidays kind of colliding together. And you're like, did you just throw like the World Series and the Apple Cup in there as a holiday? I did. Because it can feel that way for some folks. It can feel that way. Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now, we have this Halloween and yet there are Christmas stuff. There, the stores are filled with Christmas stuff. And you're like, we haven't even made it to Halloween yet. And so you have the, uh, the uh, man, in fact, I, I love this. I don't know if you have these hanging on your Christmas tree, but they're available for your Christmas tree because you didn't know what to do with the mashup. And so uh, just go ahead and get your pumpkins, put them there. Uh, last night I had a chance, we uh, carved some pumpkins at our house. And you know what's going to happen to those pumpkins, don't you? They're going to look great for about a day. And then they're going to fade, and then some animal is going to eat them, and we're going to give those away. Or what's, It's just so fast. So before we get to Halloween, can I go to Christmas? Anybody going to go to Christmas today? Let's begin with Christmas today. Let's begin with Christmas. I'm in Matthew chapter 2, and this passage is normally read at Christmas time. It is about the Magi. Here's what it says. Matthew chapter 2. By the way, we're going back to the book of Micah. So you're like, I thought we were in Micah. We are. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 6, here's what it says. Here's Christmas. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east, magi, came to Jerusalem saying, I love this question, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Where is the Christ? Where's the Messiah? Where's the long-awaited one? Where's the one to be born? They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And there is Christmas time. We celebrate that, that Jesus was born in a little town 
of Bethlehem. And we, we begin there, but we don't want to stop there. Uh, let's just acknowledge this as we open God's word together today. This is God's word for us. Amen? Amen. 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 And so let's just understand it today. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, there were these magi, there were these wise men. It's always important to say from the east. I wonder how people from the east would have the word of God in their hands the Old Testament scriptures available to them that they would even know this. We'll see that as the people of Israel, the people of Judah, were taken from their land because of their sin and deported to the east. And so that there's a, so many things going on here. Magi from the east traveled to Jerusalem. They are seeking he who was born king of the Jews. And they saw his star when it rose. They've come to worship him. And so King Herod, known as Herod the Great in history, Herod the Great, uh, the great and terrible is true. Uh, Herod the Great does not know the scriptures. He does not know where the Christ is to be born, but he knows who to ask. And so he says, uh, let's get uh, the, the people who know in here. And so they inquire and they uh, pull together the chief priests and the scribes, those people who would know the the word of God, and they would know where the Christ was to be born. And so he pulls them together and they say, without hesitation, we know. We know where he's to be born. In fact, the prophet, they don't say it here in Matthew, but it's the prophet Micah. And we are going to go to Micah 5 today, where this is where the prophet Micah will share this good news. Micah wrote this 700 years before the wise men show up, before the wise men come from the east, Micah has given this good news. And he surprised uh, a lot of people. King Herod is surprised. He is not going to be born in Rome. He is not going to be born in Athens. He's not going to be born in Jerusalem. He would be born in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, there's a lot to be said about Bethlehem. It's a, there's a lot of history about it. In fact, you can know this even before we jump into Micah this morning, that Rachel, the wife of Jacob, would die giving birth to her second child, Benjamin, and she would be buried right there along the road near Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that will fulfill prophecy later on, that Rachel would be weeping for her children as there is so much history around the little town of Bethlehem. Boaz and Ruth would meet and marry, raise their son and their children there. In fact, one of their descendants would be a young shepherd boy. His name would be David, who would become the greatest king in Israel's history. And he would be launched to the throne from the little town of Bethlehem. Let me just tell you a little bit about the name Bethlehem, because I know you're like, I just need to know what it means. I need to know. Uh, here it is, Bethel, house, and then Bethlehem, house house of bread, house of bread. Uh, and then it has another name, Ephratha. Ephratha means fruitful. So the fruitful house of bread, it tells you much about the agricultural nature of this area. It, has, uh, it is bountiful. It has great agricultural, but it is rural. It's not going to be a big uh, metro area, and it's not because just down the road is the metro uh, capital of Jerusalem, and so Bethlehem remains a little town of Bethlehem. The fruitful house of bread. You say, why does the scripture have to say it that way? Because in the north part of Israel, there is another Bethlehem. But it is very, very clear that they are not the same place. They're not the same place. And uh, so we see, here's the prophet Micah. He would tell people that their long-awaited king who would bring peace would be born in this place. And this king, this king, he would bring and he would help sinful people sinful people to be made new. And when they're made new, they can, as Micah has already told us, by the way, the first time we've read a different verse together on Sunday morning in a long time, we've been reading Micah 6, 8 today, Micah 5, 2. But we know that when Jesus came, he would help people who are sinful to be made new. And then we can act justly and we can love mercy and we can walk humbly with our God only because he gives us that ability and power because he lives within us. And we love that. So let's do this Micah five. And we're going to just be uh, rocking and rolling this morning. So be ready for this. And uh, uh, I want you to be in Micah five. As you go there, you might uh, say, where is it? It's almost to the end of your uh, Old Testament. 
Testament. And as you go there, hopefully you've marked it like I have, and so I can get there more quickly. Uh, Micah 5, as you jump into that place, you're going to hear some good news today. But it's going to be future tense. It's going to be future tense. Everything in Micah 5 is future tense. Uh, He's going to be speaking prophetically about the future, things that are not yet but will come. So Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, here's what it says. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. Turn the page. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. Then here's verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And I want to keep reading, but we got to stop there. We got to see this as we understand text in context, always text in context, that we understand it rightly as we look at it. Here's what it is. It's good to be reminded as we look at today's passage, it's future tense. He's speaking prophetically into the future. This is what it's going to be like. But he's not always speaking, even though it looks like the same sentence about the same time period. We call it the prophet's view, where God reveals details to the prophet, but he doesn't reveal them all in the same way. Let's put that graphic up there, the prophet's view. We advent number one, that is when Jesus came. We celebrate that at Christmas time. That's why we began with Micah, uh, or excuse me, Matthew today, and we say, man, Jesus did come. He is coming again. And when the prophet sees it, it's like seeing the mountain peaks as we look to Rainier. It looks like it's all close together, but there may be considerable amounts of time that happen. In fact, today, as we look at the first verse in Micah chapter 5, he's going to be speaking about something that is before Jesus is coming. Before that happens, he's going to speak about that in verse 1, and then in verse 2, which he's saying in the same breath, he doesn't even take a pause. He goes on. And it sounds like it's happening simultaneously, but it's not. Let's look at it. Verse 1 says this, as we look at Micah chapter 5, verse 1. Now muster you troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. That means Jerusalem has a siege work against it. That means uh, the capital is under fire. With the rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. He said, well, when did that happen? Is that when Jesus was taken uh, on the night of his crucifixion? It's actually not talking about Jesus. Verse 1 is talking about the king of Judah in 586 B.C. when siege works were built against them and there were so many troops surrounding the city that he said, man, uh, Jerusalem should go by a different name. It should be known as the daughter of troops, a place where troops uh, live and dwell. We would call Jerusalem the barracks. It's the barracks. That's what it should be known as. And so you have the prophet's view where he's saying, here's what's going to happen. And he's speaking future tense. He's speaking in 700 uh, BC. He's going to speak about something that will happen 114 years in the future when Jerusalem will fall and the king Zedekiah, this is, by the way, history. You can find this in Babylonian history. You can find it in Jewish history. You can find it in Egyptian history as they record what happened there. And the, uh, Jerusalem will fall. The people will be taken away. And King Zedekiah will try to sneak out of the city when he sees I'm in big trouble. And they will catch him. They will humiliate him by striking him across the face with a rod showing their power, striking this king down. Nobody touches the king. They say, oh yeah, we touch the king. They will kill his sons in front of him. They will put out his eyes and they will take him to Babylon. That is where he will live out the rest of his days. That is history now. But Micah is speaking about it in the future tense. This is how it's going to go. They will take the king, the judge of Israel, and they will strike him across the face and lead him off in shame. And so, verse 1, and that's where uh, we say, 
wow, there's a lot going on here. We have to understand where he is speaking. He's saying like, he, when we read it, it sounds like it's happening simultaneously. Verse one, then verse two. Verse two is when Jesus came. And so we look at this. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have uh, a number of points that we're going to just kind of march our way through this morning that uh, you would just hold on to. Every one of the points is about the king, the king, the king. And we're going to say, who is the king? The king is Jesus. Amen. As we understand who Jesus is, as we understand who the rightful king of Israel is, as we understand who the king of heaven is, who came for us, we will be encouraged. It will lead us to celebrate him well at the communion table today. And so I'm going to use some uh, different points. Some of these points will come from Warren Wiersbe. He's a pastor who's now passed away uh, from his commentary. Some of the points will come from uh, uh, maybe Charles Ryrie and his commentary. Some will come from, the, and it's kind of a mashup like the holidays today. And so be ready for this mashup. Here's uh, n- the first thing I want you to know about the king. Here it is. Number one, the king has an origin story. An origin story. In fact, our movies are filled with origin stories as we look at the superheroes. In fact, there's money to be made in just rebooting the origin story over and over again. How many origin stories can we have with Spider-Man? How many origin stories can we have of Batman? How many origin stories? Listen, the origin story for the king is very clear where he came from. Here's what it tells us in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, You are too little to be among the clans of Judah. The first thing you know is where he will be born. There's no question about where he will be born. He will be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, fruitful, fruitful house of bread. That's where he'll be born. In Judah, no other Bethlehem, not not any other place named Bethlehem, this place, this place. In fact, I'm going to show you the, the graphic there where you can see where Bethlehem is. In fact, look up where it says Jebus, Jerusalem. Jerusalem used to be known as Jebus before it was conquered by King David. And uh, Bethlehem is 5.5 miles away from Jerusalem. It's a 25-minute drive. In fact, if you went to Bethlehem today, you should probably be very careful because Bethlehem is under the Palestinian Authority's control, also known as Hamas today. That is who is in power in Bethlehem today. That is who rules and reigns in Bethlehem at this moment in time. It is there. In fact, uh, when I got to go to uh, Israel a number of years ago, it had just come under the authority of Hamas, and the place was uh, very uh, unsafe at that point. In fact, I questioned whether we should be going to Bethlehem, but we went uh, anyway, and uh, it was very much almost a ghost town that day because people were scared, and they should be. They should be because it's an unstable place. And so Bethlehem, still 5.5 miles from Jerusalem, still a 25-minute drive. If uh, you say, okay, that's that's what it takes. Uh, So you can know that's where the king would be born. King David would be born there, and then Jesus the king. Now, it tells us more about the origin story. He is not just from Bethlehem. It says this, and this is where it gets, uh, where we need a little understanding. One who is to be the ruler in Israel, one who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient days, your translation might say from eternity. That is accurate. And so we know that this king is not just a king just of, of, of noble birth. He is the king of heaven. He's from of old. He's from ancient days. He's from eternity. And yet he's just been born. The king they're looking for will be none other. Who Micah says the king you need, the king you're looking for, is none other than the king of heaven. He's the king of heaven, and he will come just as he said he would. He will come as he promised, but not in the way you really expected. In fact, I'm sure when Micah said, hey, the king is coming, he's coming to Bethlehem, and they say, where? Where is he coming? Where is Bethlehem? In fact, he makes, there's almost a joke in here where it says this, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. All the clans of Judah are mentioned in Joshua 15 and Nehemiah 11. I wrote that in the margin of my Bible because I want to remember it. Except they don't even mention Bethlehem among the clans of Judah in Joshua 15 or Nehemiah 11. It gets excluded. It gets overlooked. And Micah points that out said, they didn't even get a mention. And yet this is where the king will be born. 
This is how it will go. He will come from Bethlehem. He will be from of old. And then you need to know this about the king. Number two today. The king will bring unity to his people. Our world today cries out for unity. Did you know that? I don't know who will bring unity among the uh, Republicans and the Democrats, but it would take a special person. It would take somebody mighty and take somebody inspiring. It would take somebody supernatural. It would take that. And think about all the divisions that we have across the globe. The king will bring unity to his people. And remember, it was a divided nation, as Micah speaks. It was a nation that had been divided for a while. And he's saying, this king will gather together the people who have been divided. And he will gather together people who have been dispersed. They're all over the place. And he will gather them together and reunite them, weld them back together into a strong, unified, singular nation. Amazing. Verse 2 speaks about his coming. Verse 3 looks into the distant future. So think about this. Verse 1 He's speaking about 100 years in the future. Then he's speaking about 700 years in verse 2 into the future. And verse 3, he's speaking about something that has not happened yet. That's the prophet's view right there. He's saying, I've got things to tell you. And he's saying it in the same breath. But he's saying, listen, you need to understand that when the king, the rightful king is here, great things are about to happen. And they will happen because of who he is and his power, and his might. The king will bring unity. In fact, it speaks about the thousand-year reign of Christ, and you can read about that in Revelation chapter 20. I would write that down and go read Revelation 20 today because a great day is coming when the king will rule and reign in Jerusalem. The king from Bethlehem will be reigning in Jerusalem. And we've seen that before with David, but we will see it again with Jesus. So... Think about those two things. Now let's move to number three. The king will rule with strength and security. And I I just want you to hold on to those two terms today. Strength and security. When Jesus comes again, he will not be going back to the cross. What he did on the cross is finished. When he declared it is finished. Finished means the work of salvation. Jesus is not going back there. Jesus is not going back to the grave. The grave is empty, and we sing about that. The grave is empty. That is so good for us. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered sin, and he is coming back to rule and reign. He will be coming to Jerusalem, and he will provide beautiful and powerful leadership to the world, not to the region, Right now, right now the world is saying, what are we going to do about this region of the world? And that's not nearly far enough. We need his beautiful, powerful strength and security for his people, yes, and for the whole world. That's what Jesus will bring. He shall be great, it says, to the ends of the earth, to the very ends of the earth. And this past week, I was thinking about the news how it brought us not security. This week, the news did not bring us security. How many of you knew that? In fact, all that happened in Maine this past week, all the families that are hurting this week after another tragedy, uh, just a, a terrible time of insecurity, riddled the nation from what happened in this area, and so many questions and so many things that we don't know even yet, it brought insecurity to people. It did not bring strength and security this week. The news brought us uh, another dose of, I don't know what to do with this, and think about the political scene. It's not a secure scene. Jesus, though, is coming, and when he comes, he will set everything right. Listen, there was something, if there was something this past week that made you feel insecure, let's just... We, we've been talking about the news. We talk about politics. We talk about the other side of the nation. It feels far away. But the feeling of insecurity is so, so very personal. Maybe you felt insecure this week. Maybe you felt afraid because of something this week. Maybe you felt weak in these past seven days. Today, today is a great day to come to Jesus and to rest in him, 
that he is powerful and he is strong and he has all the security you need. I was thinking about this. The king from eternity, eternity past, the king from outside of time is ready to meet with us in the present tense. He's ready to meet with us today. The king who is outside of this globe is very interested in what's happening on this globe. And I would say this, maybe as you felt insecure, it is time to run to Jesus and to pray something like this. Jesus, I need your strength. If that's where you're at, just, you just pray this as, as we're speaking about it. Jesus, I need your strength. Jesus, I need your security. I need that. Jesus, I need you to be king over my circumstances, which are all over the map. Jesus, I need you to be king over my feelings, which are all over the map. Jesus, I need you to be king over my relationships, which are all over the map. I need you to be king over my schedule, which doesn't even feel like it has a map. I need you, Jesus. When you come to Jesus and you come and rest in his strength and his security... It doesn't mean all your circumstances are taken care of. It doesn't mean all the things in the world are are at ease. But it means that you can be at ease because he has it. And you're acknowledging it and saying, take it, Jesus. I can't. Today, you might have come rattled to this service. One of the things that Jesus would want you to leave with today is the peace that only the king of peace, the peace of heaven in your heart and your mind as you leave this place today. Micah 5, verse 5. Listen to how it starts. And he shall be there, say it out loud. He shall be there Peace. Where can I find peace? I can tell you. And you can read it. The word of God speaks into it today. Where can I find the peace that I long for? I can find the peace that I need in Jesus. Now, this is what's going to happen. Future tense. When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds, eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. That's a reference to Genesis. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Verse 7, Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples. Would you underline this phrase in your Bible? Like dew, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion. Would you underline that in your Bible? Like a lion, like dew, and like a lion. Among the beasts of the forest, like the young lion, among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through, treads down, and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Your hand, your hand shall be lifted up over the adversaries, and all of your enemies shall be cut off. This is speaking, future tense, about when Jesus comes to rule and reign, what it's going to be like. First, he's going to provide strength and security, and you're going to say, okay, uh, how is that going to happen? He has to deal with the enemies of the people of Israel. Number four today, write this down. The king, the king, the king will destroy Israel's enemies. And it it begins to talk about the Assyrian, the Assyrian, the Assyrian. And this is one of those things you have to understand a little bit of when it describes this. It's not even saying the actual Assyrian army. It's describing all of the enemies who hate the people of Israel. And by the way, watch the news, listen to the news, read the news. There are many without Logic, hate the people of Israel. Without logic, hate them. It says the Assyrians, another way of saying the many enemies, uh, he will deal with them. In fact, he talks about this. There's a phrasing in here that that takes a little bit of understanding. He says seven shepherds and eight leaders. And he's saying there's going to be several leaders that rise up, but only one 
will deliver the strength and security that the people need. Only one can defeat the many enemies of the people of Israel, and that is the king. The glory goes to the king. The king will destroy Israel's enemy. And when that happens, when that happens, something is going to transpire that the people who now dwell in peace and security, they will become like this. His people will be refreshing. Do. Think back, not today. Think back to the heat of the summer when it was blistering. Think back, I can think back, when my AC broke at my house and it was hot and it was hot he said his people will be refreshing like the dew like like the like the rain brings refreshment he says then let me give you one other illustration both of these are similes like or as like the dew like a strong lion his people will be strong like a lion It is a beautiful picture of uh, the people of God in the future, but I believe it is a beautiful picture also today what the people of God, Christians, should be through the power of the Holy Spirit wherever we go. Think about it this way. What a beautiful picture it would be in our community. What a beautiful picture it would be in our valley. What a beautiful picture it would be in our region, our nation, our world. If God's people, that is anyone who calls on the name of Jesus as the only way of salvation, God's people would bring refreshment wherever we go. You walk into a tense situation at work and you bring refreshment. When you walk into a a heated argument in the classroom and you are the cooling element. When you walk into, and sometimes people dread the holidays, by the way, the mashup of the holidays. They dread that because they know that last year, Uncle Joe at Thanksgiving was an absolute difficult person. (laughs) What were you thinking? Yeah. Yeah. God's people bring refreshment wherever we go. God's people also bring strong leadership. What a beautiful picture that you could ask God, Lord, wherever I go this week, I pray that I would bring refreshment like the dew in the middle of summer. Wherever I go, I pray that I would bring leadership. And leadership doesn't have to be loud. Leadership can just be clear and strong, a presence, a lion, A young lion among the flocks of sheep. Listen, a a difference maker. I pray that we would be that. Micah chapter 5, verse 10. In that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you. This will take a little understanding. And will destroy your chariots. He's speaking to the people of Israel here, by the way. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds, and I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes, and I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images, that's a false god, female deity, from among you and destroy your cities and in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey I'm going to tell you that you should not race through Micah 5 and think I'm going to get it in two minutes or less there's so much happening here Micah 5 verse 10 the fifth thing today that you would see about the king here it is the king will purge his people for his glory He will refine his people for his glory. He will help his people be reset in their thinking. He will help his people be reset in the way they live. He will help his people by purging them of a couple of things that are holding them back. Let me tell you the first thing he says he's going to purge from them, and it seems strange. He will purge his people from their military dependence. When he says, I'm going to cut down your horses, I'm going to destroy your chariots and your strongholds, I'm going to take all of that away from you, everything you put your faith and trust in today, I'm going to take those away from you. You won't need those anymore because the king who has all the strength and power you need 
is here. Don't put your hope in military might anymore. That is not today. That is future tense. He said, I'm going to purge that from you. In fact, what he's dealing with there is a self-reliance that says, we don't need Jesus. We have weapons. We don't need Jesus. We have our training. We don't need Jesus. We are powerful all on our own. He said, I'm going to purge that from you. The second thing he says, I'm going to purge from you. And it gets very personal now. He's going to, I'm going to purge your false worship. You worship all kinds of things besides the living God. It's happening. It happens in our valley. It happens right here. It happens in our hearts. We worship all kinds of things that lead us away from Jesus. He said, I'm going to purge that from you. I'm going to take that from you. I'm going to get rid of your sorcerers. I'm going to get rid of your fortune tellers. I'm going to get rid of your your carved images that you bow down to just after making it with your own hands. And then you pray to it. That's silly. But people do it all the time. He'll purge them of their false worship. And finally, number six today, where he ends this, again, future tense. This has not happened. The king will bring his perfect justice against sin. Notice this, that he is going to deal with the sins of the nations, and he says it very clearly here, who did not obey, who know what God wants and say, I heard you, no. No, I'm not doing it. I'm going to tell you Micah 5 has this beautiful picture, beautiful picture of the king. And you're not to see anything else today. Don't get caught up in the, in the armies being set aside and the, and the carved images being set aside and miss the king. Don't miss the king. Today, we are going to make sure we don't miss the king as we turn our eyes from what he will do in the future and we refocus on what he has done for us. At the cross, Jesus took the punishment for our sins. He speaks about punishing nations who would not obey. Jesus took our punishment because we would not obey. He took it upon himself took the punishment for our sins so that we might enjoy a relationship with him so that we might run to him and have strength and security that is not our own given to us. The only reason that we can read Micah 5 and say the future is bright and the future is secure, the only reason we can say that is because Jesus has secured it. And so we're going to celebrate the Savior together. We've been given a beautiful gift to help us with this. It's called the Lord's Table. It is communion. I'm going to invite Darren Thomas, who's one of our elders, to come and just lead us in celebrating communion together.